we have this grand ambition to understand everything that changes in time and is described by a law, law of nature. That's called dynamical system. The Greek word doesn't have change in time, but it means force or forcing, but you know, but that's what's meant by it. there is things are being pushed and they move around. So that's the grand thing. And then we decided to live in one dimensional world. And on face of it, that looked totally boring because in one dimension, on infinite line, you know, what can happen? You can either get stuck someplace or you can wander off to infinity. But we got lots of mileage from this because we introduced it to the notion of fixed points, which you get there. And then stability, which is very important, who is stable, unstable. And then the qualitative theory, what the flows look like. You know, when you're giving an equation and you don't have a clue what it means, uh, but if you can draw some pictures, you can get very good intuition. And then we introduce bifurcations, uh, which are a big deal. If you have parameters that describe your law and you can vary them, like the pressure or temperature or something in some you know, device. And we got a bunch of bifurcations, which are important, generic. And we have it done with one dimension. So we turn the chapter to the next chapter. No, we are still in one dimension. You know, what was missing from one dimension discussion, not discussion, but possibilities, one dimension, is that very early on we showed in one dimension you cannot oscillate. Because any oscillation would mean your velocity would have to change sign from being plus to minus. You have to go to zero the moment in one dimension you have zero velocity, you're done because you're not moving, so nothing happens. So you cannot have oscillations. But here is a very clever trick. You take the infinite line you take interval on it from zero to two pi, and then you just roll it onto a circle of radius one. And you can roll this infinite line as much as you wish. You will only be on interval zero to pi. And that actually is a very, as you will see from the examples, is a very, very common phenomenon in the world around us and the nature. So it's not as artificial as it looks like when I tell you, okay, let's study. This is a math course and we'll be on a circle. Uh, you need to understand this to understand many things in biophysics, chemistry, uh, engineering, mechanical engineering, etc. We write an equation, little bit. And we say, well, you know, there is some law that says the change of theta in time is given by a velocity field. So that, that is a vector field. Problem is one dimensional, so vector field is one dimensional as well. But now it's defined on the circle. And uh, it's still one dimension. So now, uh, when you look at that problem, what you're doing is you're running on a circle. And on the circle, every so often you come back to where you were. So you have periodic things. After some period, you come back. So you'll encounter periodic solution. We will encounter, meaning the same thing, but something we really, really know a lot from our world. You know, your heart is a blood pump that does this. In New Norwegian, your heart is called blood pump. You know, if it's not doing it periodically, you're in terrible trouble. So the big new thing that happens now are oscillations. And they're every place. It's very important. 
And, you know, amusingly enough, my own research actually <laughs> right now for the last few years does a lot of this of being on infinite line or a grid and a circular line. So it's not so far from I actually do for living. So let's take a simple example. Let's say that the velocity field, you know, my speed is sine theta. You know, why did I take a trigonometric function? Well, it has a property that as I go from zero to two pi, I get around the circle, but when I increment theta by two pi, a no trigonometric function is the same. So if I use trigonometric functions to describe velocity fields, I will automatically build in periodicity, and this is a nice smooth function. Everything recommends it. And when you look at it, you can immediately analyze it in a way that we know how to analyze these things. So you can say, well, you know, when theta is zero, sine is zero, so there is no velocity. So there is one fixed point. But you know, sine also vanishes when theta is pi. So if you go half the circle around, there is uh, another fixed point. If I'm here and, you know, everything is meant to be clockwise. So the idea was you had an infinite line that went from left to right and you roll it upwards and you get anti-clockwise turning thing. You right thumb rule this. Um, so I have fixed points. Uh, they are theta equals zero, theta equals pi. Now, if I increase theta a little bit, this is positive. So my velocity is positive. I'm incrementing my angle theta. So I'm moving this way. If I have theta that's slightly negative, close to zero, but slightly negative, then I'll be decreasing my velocity. So I'm going in the opposite clockwise direction. And it's obvious how this works. This guy at zero is unstable. Remember, as a rule, I'm 50% of time wrong, especially on this kind of binary questions. So if I'm doing something wrong, you catch me. Then you say, well, wait a minute, I've seen this equation before. Indeed you have, we started with this equation. So we looked at this thing, but on infinite line. And uh, what we found on infinite line, that for every multiple of pi, this thing was zero. And things agree with our sketch here. It says, at zero, I have an unstable fixed point. It flows in a pi. And it'll do that also if I go in the opposite direction. And now you can see the difference between living on an infinite line and circle. These two points are identified. So living, when you have oscillations and you can go to the phase plane rather than state space, you know, Cartesian coordinates, but angular coordinates, it could be very compact and smart way to do this because this little circle, you can realize this is just when you open it up, there are many, infinitely many copies of a real line, but you know, if you understand one copy, you are done. So uh, you will see this often, you know, you will, it's called unwrapping of the phase, etc. There's always relation between infinite line, for example, in crystals, crystal is meant to be infinite, but when you look at one little block on a crystal, one inter uh, atomic distance, you will find out that that gets repeated infinitely many 
in this direction, maybe a different in the other direction, and you will find the same thing. Just studying one domain with periodic boundary conditions, saying when you cross here, it just goes smoothly through, uh, is actually all you need to understand crystallography. Plus a uh, few epsilons. But uh, you have to be slightly careful doing these equations because let's just write totally obvious equation on a line. You know, if you say that theta is, you know, smaller than infinity and larger than minus infinity, so that's a line. On a line, this is perfectly well defined. But uh, if I run on a circle using this, I just, you know, move. This is positive, so I just keep accelerating by integrating this guy. You please understand that's actually exponential acceleration because derivative is the same as function itself. So, you know, when I get to this point, it used to be that theta was zero, but now as I approach it, from this side, I'm approaching theta equals 2 pi. And that's a little bit crazy, right? I have two values. Now, if I do this another time, I'll have three values. And in general, I'll have a slightly crazy law that says that theta uh, as a function of where I am on this zero to two pi angle, its velocity, its angular velocity, if you wish, should be the same to make sense out of this. as what happens if I run once around or any integer time, you know, k equals minus seven, minus six, minus five, zero, one, two, three, off to infinity, any integer k. So to have continuity or smoothness, which, you know, nature likes, I have a constraint on what kind of velocity fields I'm allowed to do. So this is a general formula, but on a, on a circle, only legal velocity satisfy that when you go around one, two, three, four, five times, uh, you're back. In other words, you demand that your law that describes how you're being shoved around in these few dimensions is 2 pi periodic. Now, that's not such a big deal because, you know, we just use one of these laws like that. You know, that's an example. Sine of theta is like that. And actually, any trigonometric function will uh, do. So the natural basis, whenever you start doing this kind of oscillatory problems, the natural basis will be uh, sines, cosines of the angle and their multiples, or trigonometric basis. Or if you're in a complex representation, there might be complex exponentials. And uh, that just says, and you kind of know that, that uh, whenever you have something on a circle, some oscillation, you should look at its Fourier transform, which is to count uh, frequencies uh, in you know 
multiple of one over two pi. And uh, if you just get one frequency only, you say this is a pure tone, this is a pure oscillation. But if you get multiples, you say, well, you know, this is a, a musical string that has a whole spectrum of things that give it quality. So you, you kind of know this from your experience with music, etc. But it just says whenever you have periodic problems, you probably want to use uh, a Fourier basis or periodic basis to describe that. So now let's look at some examples of oscillators. So the simple oscillator is the one that you're most familiar with. Uh, you define an angle or phase theta. And you say, well, that theta is incrementing at a constant frequency. So you know how to solve this analytically. So if you for a moment ignore that you are on a circle, but you say on an infinite line, it just means that I start at some angle. I have this angular velocity or angular frequency, as is it called. And as the time goes, my, uh, my phase just increases linearly or uniformly with time. So this is uh, angular frequency, this object here. When we are on a circle, we also know that we have a, a period because we know that whenever we increment our angle by 2 pi, we are back where we started. So that's a period that we use to traverse one return, one period. In other words, period associated with the uniform oscillator is 2 pi divided by omega. This number is period. If you go 2 pi around, you identify 2, you get period. So whenever you have oscillatory motions, you either talk about frequency, you know, the note, uh, that's very natural in lots of situations where motion is extremely fast. That's what happens in atomic physics. So, you know, you have strings which are vibrating at the frequencies, high frequencies, compared to what we perceive as motion. Then we like to talk about frequencies. If something is wobbling around slowly, you know, comes back every 30 seconds or a minute, we like to Think of it as a period. Here is another version of this uniform oscillator, which is uh, gives us a little bit of extra information already, even though it's a simple uniform motion. Suppose that you have two joggers who are running on a circular track. A speedy and pokey, says Strogatz, and he would know. But they're individual, so they have different speeds, which you can describe in meters per second or, you know, imperial gallons per whatever. But uh, you can also say, uh, you know, this thing has a unit radius in some units, and I only care about the angle. So these are two angular velocities. Now that they have different velocity, the natural thing is to see 
uh, when do they come together? Because, you know, maybe speed is going away from Pokey, who is very slow, but then speed will come from the back and they'll join. So what you want to do is you want to study the phase difference. In other words, the difference between, I know that there are two different velocities of these disguise. So if I divide the difference of the two angles and I call it phi, then the velocity, the distance, angle of the distance in time will be the difference of two velocities. But that's omega one minus omega two. And now you're interested at instance when speedy is same place as pokey. And that means you're interested in the period of their relative difference. So period, you know, when the overlap is 2 pi, but now you're looking at the difference of the two velocities. So this happens a lot, sometimes good, sometimes bad, but it, it's called a beat frequency. When you have two frequencies, then, uh, their difference is very significant. In this simple case, it's omega 2 minus omega 1. And for my senior undergraduate thesis, I used this plus Einstein. <laughs> to measure uh, ribosome sizes. So, uh, so these are, you know, little protein making engines in our body, the big macromolecules. And the way I use the beat frequency is that I shine light on them. Now light is very fast and has very high frequency and these guys are very slow. They're big, like a molecule in water. They move very slowly and they reflect light and that light is slightly shifted. So there is a very small shift. And uh, you are able, if you can measure beat frequencies in that case, you know, you're able to use light uh, which is, you know, I don't know what the frequency is, <laughs> 10 to the minus 6, 9, 10, I forget uh, what are the units you tell me. And if you have these two same frequencies, slightly shifted frequency, you can measure some very slow beat motions, which are in seconds and not in, you know, femtoseconds. So simple idea, but very powerful. Uh, whole experimental method of doing many measurements. For example, uh, you know, if you're trying to get gravitational waves from uh, colliding black holes, you're also doing that. Whenever you have frequencies that are very close, the bit frequency can be very important. So that's one set of applications, the simplest possible applications of running around a circle but you do this at uniform velocity. Now, what happens in biology very often is that you have clocks. They're not very good clocks, you know, they're not like oscillations of silicon crystal or some other things we use to set standards of time measurement. Uh, you know, they're like our human, uh, 
heartbeat and circadian beat, lots of biological beats, which are not very perfect. But they have a property that when you look at evolution of the system through a period, there are regions where the system speeds up like crazy, and then there are regions where it slows down. And if you just throw it at the period, you wouldn't even realize this is going on because the period itself is, uh, you know, some nice reasonable period, uh, 60 hertz, I don't know what. But when you look in uh, detail of what's going on, you find a great deal of non-uniformity in the motion. So in first approximation, you have uniform oscillation. But then there is something that's non-uniform. And uh, you already know we only allow to use sines and cosines and multiple of the angles to make the law legal and smooth. So the simplest example is the kind that we've just been playing with so far. Let's assume that as I go around, you know, I get either sped up or slow down, depending on the value of sign. Uh, and there'll be another parameter, which tells me how strong this effect is. You know, is it like detecting gravitational waves where I have to detect uh, amplitudes of, you know, order 10 to the minus 41. <laughs> compared to unit one in my lab. That's what you do in general, uh, in general relativity, experimental general relativity. But in uh, biology, you're happy with if this A is roughly of order one, because, you know, sine is of order one, there is this omega. So if A and omega are comparable, interesting things, as you will see, happen. And there is some minus sign, which is just a convention. Uh, you'll see why when you take the river to be convenient. So the idea is that you have two parameters in non-uniform system, at least. Could be more. You know, one of them is mean velocity or mean frequency. And the other one is the amplitude of non-uniform part. How strong is it? And again, easiest thing to is to write this on interval from minus pi to pi because everything re repeats outside of the interval and circle does the interval. So where theta is zero, the value of your velocity is this mean velocity. And same thing happens when theta is pi or minus pi. But as you go halfway around, you will see that you either slow down because velocity is subtracted or added by this prop parameter A, the amplitude. So now we'll repeat the same stuff that we did on a line, but we do it on a circle. You know, it's a curve. It has a mean that I can regulate. And it has the amplitude. Now, this is a pure number sign. It's something that's roughly speaking, of order one or one half the position. So these are constants of the same dimension. And clearly, uh, if they're comparable in size, something is going to happen because this goes from plus to minus A, depending what theta is. So there'll be competition between this mean term and other term. So you are interested in uh, three possibilities. When A is smaller than omega, then this term can never reverse the sign of the angular velocity. 
or if I draw it as a graph, I drew it already, but I'll repeat it. Uh, when I'm at pi over two, I have slowest velocity, but it's positive. So I never, nothing ever interesting happens. Then there'll be, as usual, a critical value when they're exactly the same. Then uh, when theta is pi over two, they exactly cancel. So the function now touches theta dot equals zero axis. And now what we find out is that from this side, I have increasing velocity, so that's attractive point. But on the other side, I have increasing velocity, so I'm going away from it. So that you know that's what critical point tend to look like. The coalescences of what? Of stable and unstable fixed points. When A dominates the mean velocity, then sometimes uh, this term will outrun uh, the velocity, will make it faster, but other times it actually reverses it and make it negative. And we will have attractive fixed point and repelling fixed point of kind that you know. And now uh, there's an interesting phenomenon uh, which is experimentally observable is that even though I'm running, non-uniformity of this oscillator means that if I'm close to a slightly smaller than omega, there will be a period where velocity is very small. So an arbitrarily small, depending how small I make it, which means I'm running, running, running at my typical omega, and suddenly I get into a bottleneck like in the traffic, where everybody creeps, everybody in the car ahead of me is creeping very slowly. And depending how close am I, as long as I don't actually touch the axis, I can spend arbitrarily a long time in there. Other way to look at the same thing is to not draw it on a line, but draw it as a circle map. So what happens in this case, you know, I'm running, going to the right means I'm running anti-clockwise, so I'm running any place. But when I'm half away around, uh, a quarter of the full circle around, then I'm very slow. And here I'm very fast. So that's what's meant by non-uniform oscillator, right? Non-uniform velocity. Now when uh, theta is exactly pi over two, and amplitude exactly cancels mean velocity, I have this very boring motion that you know, if I start on this side, I run away and I come back and I slow down so it's like a top of the mountain or invert pendulum. You know, I go and then I come back and I just have enough energy to come back, but I cannot cross. So that's a critical situation. And then I have the situation where uh, I actually have two fixed points, so I can run away. Uh, from one of them, and invariably I end up in the other one. And you can see, you know, there might be, there could be more fixed points because you can see how that would happen when we look at this picture here. You know, you can also, there's lots of fixed points. So if I make a circle that's not of perimeter 2 pi, but 4 pi, I have more of this stuff, but that'll be the same number of 
repelling and attracting fixed points. Now, that's a qualitative thing, but they have learned something else so far, and this is that we also care about stability. You know, we can get more out of this than what I've just given you so far. Because if I have a fixed point, fixed point means is that I'm at the fixed point, I evaluate the velocity at the fixed point, and I get zero. When I look at this equation, you know, the fixed point will happen when these two guys cancel each other. In other words, sine evaluated fixed point should be exactly this other term, omega divided by A. Now, I know this amazing trigonometric fact that once I know a sine, I also know a cosine. That's a square root of one minus sine squared. And I'm writing this because I'll have to take derivative to find stability. Remember, derivative is a great velocity gradient, variation of velocity as you move in spatial direction. So I will need cosine. So stability is I take my I take the derivative of my law and then I set once I've taken the derivative I evaluate it at a fixed point. The derivative constant is zero and I get minus a cosine theta, evaluate a fixed point. And now I can see what's going on. The theta the cosine, you know, can be positive or negative. So I have two situations, larger than zero, lower than zero. This, of course, we are looking at the case where we actually have fixed points, which means amplitude overwhelms the mean frequency. And if that happens, then this is positive number and this is minus amplitude. We always assume it's a positive number, of course. Uh, so this is negative. So that means my stability is such that I go toward that fixed point. And if cosine of theta is uh, negative, then I'm unstable. So now I have explicit expression for the stability of the two points evaluated, one stable, one unstable. Now, another important bit of information I had about uniform oscillator was the period you know, time when I got back. And for non-uniform oscillators, in general, 
getting the period is calculation, very often numerical calculation. In this simple example, it's still doable by the hand. Because uh, as I move around, my speed is changing and I have to integrate to find out how far I've gotten after a given time. And the period will be that particular time that, you know, I sped up, slowed down, etc. And I'm exactly where I started. So here's a little trick. You can say, well, a period, I can write it as an integral from I started to where I ended. But now I can change my coordinates to angular coordinates. So I change this to d d theta. times d theta. Now in theta, this means I have to go from zero to two pi. And I recognize <laughs> and when you have periodic motions, you know, it's often nice to just indicate not zero to two pi because it doesn't actually matter where you start as long as you go through all period. So sometimes you say it's a circular integral, if you like that notation. That does it. And this thing is, if I invert it, this is just the velocity, delta theta over t. And that's what I have as a function of theta. So this is delta theta. And my velocity is omega minus a sine theta. Now you realize uh, it makes sense to talk about period only in this example where you keep going. These two cases are, you know, death. You start and you come back, takes infinite time. There is no notion of period for the motions where you get glued to some fixed point. But as long as there are no fixed points on a circle, period is perfectly well defined. So this all works only for amplitude suffi you know, sufficiently weak, not to overwhelm the mean frequency. And now, you know, it's not my job to give you a calculus course again. So go figure it out. But, you know, this is one of those doable integrals analytically. And what comes out of this integral is a squared mean frequency minus squared amplitude. So now that's analytic answer. For given frequency in A, you can just write that number. So here I can plot it. When omega is zero, I'm in a uniform oscillator. So I have the usual formula, two pi over omega for period. As omega increases, you know, this denominator, there's difference between these two guys decreases and it's a one over square root of inverse. So uh, as amplitude gets bigger and bigger, but still smaller than mean frequency, this increases until I get to the point where they're exactly the same and it takes off to infinity. And that's good news, you know, I should do that because I'm getting to this situation between fast and slow, when slow is such that it's actually infinite, you know, because I end up in a fixed point or I start out in a fixed point. So that clearly has period infinity, so that's behaving the way it should. Now here, there is a famous identity that mastered by many in a graduate, well, high school students entering Georgia Tech. 
I can write this as a product of omega minus amplitude, omega plus amplitude. And now I can actually take a limit and get a you know, good approximate answer. Uh, I can take amplitude to omega from below. And what happens is that this just becomes two omega. So there's a two pi over two omega. But this term can get very small in the denominator. In other words, it can explode. There's an explicit difference between the two times uh, so that says that when I come to the critical point I know in great detail how an observable that you can measure when you study heartbeat or whatever uh, will behave and it will grow like one over square root of omega minus alpha. So this is what is happens very often in physics that you you know here it's a simple answer, but you might have very complicated theory of the you know chicken hearts with many, many variables and many chemicals and many electric and temperature and whatnot. Things going into a model, you know, an accurate model. But when you approach this end where it almost doesn't beat anymore, you can often isolate critical behavior and uh, study that, study that in experiments, study that in theory. Uh, and that behavior tends to be often what's called universal, meaning it doesn't really care whether you're looking at chicken hearts or you're looking at rolls of helium in a you know, low temperature experiment, or you're looking at Josephson junction in, a, you know, doing measurements on your brain or something, a quantum device, they will all exhibit the same qualitative behavior. And I've told you before that one thing that's very important in physics is symmetry. So that drives much of physical thinking, you know, understanding what are symmetries and what are the laws of nature consistent with them. But another very important driver is that uh, physicists are incredibly lazy people. I mean, you know, there are some hardworking computer programmers and uh, mechanical engineers which will, you know, work for years to build something that we can send with a satellite to Mars. But physicists are looking for quick money and moving on always. And uh, they're always looking for universality. Uh, can I say something about this problem, which is true for 7,000 of other problems, so I don't have to think 7,000 more. That's called renormalization theory. And, uh, it's a very important part of theoretical physics. And this is the simplest kind of example. You find out that no matter what this laggardly thing was doing, when the amplitude and um, frequencies compete, uh, you can get a very simple description times some constant which you maybe measure in an experiment because it's too hard to compute. Uh, but you predict how things will freeze or thaw or you know, uh, die or come alive uh, using this stuff. And it's every place in physics. It's a 
you know, wonderful thing where you can get it because you get one answer to many, many questions. Uh, there is another way to think about this, which I've already introduced. I mean, it's a you know same set of ideas, but maybe phrased differently. When you look at the bottleneck, what's going on is that you are almost getting frozen when you add the bottleneck. at this particular value of your phase. And if I plot what's my phase at time t in all of these kind of things, you, you observe the following thing. You, you know, start changing your phase using your law. You get close to this point. Now you slow down, you get very, very slow. And you spend a long, long time there. And if you have patience enough, you realize eventually you get out again. So there is a, a sticky time. You know, glue to this. And you might ask yourself, you know, can I learn something about a system by changing one parameter and measuring this glue time? Because that tends to be easy to measure on the mean. You know, you can do lots of experiments and get good statistics on it. And now the idea that we have introduced several times already is very helpful. You know, you had some general function, but it was smooth in the region of interest. It had derivatives. For physicists, all the derivatives. For mathematicians, it had at least few derivatives. And if you look close to it and you look in the neighborhood, it looks to you like it's a parabola. You know, you have to go some distance away to notice some deviations. So now you can decide that instead of calling this theta, you call it x like you used to. You put the origin right here instead of at minus 17. And then when you add the origin, the velocity, this is velocity. The velocity is this parameter r. And as you go off it on both directions, you just pick up the quadratic term because you're evaluating where the first term by definition is zero. So that's a normal form. We have run into this already. You know, when you're looking at small neighborhood, you don't know whether you're in a circle or you're free to run any place you go. When you're on a flat earth, you think you can go any place, but if you go for a long time, you come back, you discover you're on a circle. But locally, everything looks flat. So the normal forms are good. And um, you can use this normal form. I will not continue doing this, but it's described well in a book, just like we have done it already, to compute do it by doing that integral to compute the glue time. Essentially, the idea of the glue time is that when you're in a circle and you have a sticky region, if you're away from the bottleneck region, you move very fast, you know, on order one in units of two pi's. But when you get close to this point, you can be arbitrarily long. So all you have to do is you have to compute the whole period and say, you know, the whole period is really the glued period, but we have just computed the whole period. So we have this form now, analytically. So we can produce, you know, compute this time of being stuck in this bottleneck. Uh, 